Hello, my name is Melody Rolke Parker. I am presently at the National Cancer Institute based in Frederick, Maryland, where I'm working as a veterinarian and scientist. What I'm going to talk to you today about is work that uh, the National Cancer Institute actually has been involved in over the last 15 plus years, but it's work that I started working on in the early 80s when I was employed by Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. And I took this position with Florida as their field veterinarian working on an endangered Florida panther because during a capture procedure of a wild, free-ranging Florida panther, unfortunately, one of the animals died. And because this was a very critically endangered animal, it's the state animal of Florida, tremendous public pressure arose about the death of this animal, and basically the governor of the state issued an edict that no panthers would be handled unless a veterinarian was on the staff. So I joined the team in the early 80s, and what I'm going to share with you today is the unfolding of a, an amazing story of the biomedical findings of this endangered animal, wherein we basically documented over a nine-year period that I was on the project, a bizarre array of genetic problems related to inbreeding in this critically endangered population of animals, such that in 1996, the decision was made to actually outcross these animals with a related group of cougars from Texas to help salvage the remaining Florida panthers living in the swamp. So with that, I'm going to go to the slides and tell you the, the story of our biomedical findings on this subspecies. The Florida panther, otherwise known as a painter, catamount, cougar, puma, depending on the region of the country that you live in, is an endangered subspecies of the species Felis concolor. That is one of the most widely dispersed of mammals in North and South America, historically ranging throughout n both North and South America. The stippled area here in the eastern United States shows the historic range where basically now th the cat has been extirpated from that part of its range. There are, however, reports in the northern parts of New York and uh, Great Lakes region. However, in terms of viable population, it's primarily in the western United States where they still exist and in the Florida swamps. This is the historic range of the subspecies Felis concolor corii as it existed probably 200 years ago. For the last 150 years or so, the cats have been isolated in the panhandle area of Florida and to the tip. Probably throughout this part of the country, there hasn't been um, good populations of cats for at least 150 to 200 years. Now today these animals exist in the hardwood hammocks and uh, pine flatwoods and swamps in the southern part of Florida. And probably the only reason that there are any cats surviving today at all is because of the swamp ecosystem and the habitat that was basically un uninhabitable and uninteresting to human beings that have allowed the cats to survive down in the, in the southern tip. And they are existing down here in the Big Cypress and Everglades swamp systems. And you can see all this white area is developed land in southern Florida, with this being the only area that's basically left in its natural state in the southern part of the, of the state. Now, the reason that the cat is in its current um, population plight is that um, starting in the turn of the century, I think about 1920, there was a predator control bounty actually paid for, for killing mountain lions. And this was based on the idea that these animals were killing livestock or were a threat to human beings. And yet, what's very interesting about the Florida panther population is there has never, ever been um, a, a case of a cat actually attacking a human being, unlike situations in Southern California or in Texas or in British Columbia. Um, but needless to say, the cats were brought down to very, very low numbers. Um, in by 1960 or 64 when it became a protected animal in the state. And then since then, um, we have this rampant human development going on in South Florida where you have suburbs butting up right against swamps where there are cats living. Further, you have tremendous agricultural interests in Southern Florida with the uh, tomato growers, for instance, and also the orange groves in the early 80s, there was a major freeze in the Orlando area up in the mid part of the state, which pushed all the orange groves down to the southern remaining panther habitat, and that has just further impacted on the remaining habitat for this cat. To give you a perspective, this is the, the Lake Okeechobee and the river of grass slowly flowing waters that used to flow out to the Gulf of Mexico, as you see here. And this picture is drawn 
um, in the pre-1940 era. In the 1940s, there were major hurricanes that came, came on shore, and when the waters hit Lake Okeechobee, many, many hundreds of people were, were drowned in that water, and the Army Corps of en Engineers set about to get rid of the waters in Florida, and a whole series of ditches and drains and dikes around the lake um, that prohibit water from coming out in a flood situation, and also have promoted the draining and the drying of southern Florida, which then allows for more encroachment by human beings, as well as tremendous agricultural um, activities, as you see here, that in the sugar cane fields just north of Lake Okeechobee. And this uh, drawing here is actually from about 1973. So a lot of habitat has been lost even since then. We're going to come back to this habitat structure here because it's very important to some of the stories that you're going to hear. The Big Cypress on this side, the Everglades National Park over here. Now, some peculiar uh, morphologic traits of a Florida panther. When we started capturing cats in the early 80s, what we started noticing was the basically every cat we handled had this had a very peculiar anomaly in the in the vertebral bodies of the distal tail. And you can see this animal has a couple hemavertebrae here in its coccygeal vertebrae that result in the kinking or coiling of the tail tip. Now this one is a very pronounced, some of them were only L shapes, but basically every cat had this. And this was interesting, not highly, it didn't seem to have any um, survival uh, impact on the animals, um, but it was at least reminiscent of what's seen in some species of cats or some races of cats such as Siamese cats where some breedings have got kink tails. Um, but it raised an interesting question about, well, was this indicative of maybe an inbreeding situation in the panther or just an interesting trait? Another phenomena is they had a cowlick or ridge behind the shoulder blades in the middle of the back, very much like a Rhodesian ridgeback dog. Again, this trait was seen in other populations of pumas, particularly in the western United States where 15% of the cats in New Mexico, for instance, on um, historical specimens in museums have a cowlick. Um, in our Florida panthers, about 80% of the animals presented with this cowlick. Other characteristics of the Florida panther is they have a very pronounced Roman-nosed face here. And for those of you not used to looking at cougar faces, where to you they might one cougar might look like any other cougar, <laughs> I assure you that they do not. Um, and for instance, look at this high-browed face here of the Florida panther male compared to a very short, stubby face um, profile of a Chilean mountain lion, a male, also a male from southern, southern Chile. Again, a long face, high-browed face, and a short face. So we've got morphological differences um, separating one group of cougars from another, and these are so pronounced that have been used historically by taxonomists to segregate uh, different subspecies from one another. But as I mentioned earlier, the reason I was involved in this project was to improve the capture, safety of capture of these animals. And you can appreciate um, being confronted with a cat 40, 50, 60 feet high in the tree and trying to evaluate its physical condition, its renal function, its body weight, its age, all these things standing below it in order to determine the right amount of anesthesia is a rather daunting task. And um, in order to improve the safety of these captures, what we did was design a series of, of changes, or we implemented a series of changes, one of them by switching to an air-powered rifle um, teleject system and, and a crash bag underneath. What you see here is a big stuff sack filled with trash bags, um, a net, a climber with ropes climbing up to that cat, all aimed at trying to get that cat out of the tree without it just falling. Um, and damaging itself. So the t my task was to give it just the amount of right amount of drug so it would be groggy but not fall, but not be so awake that it might attack the climber. So that is a fine line, um, again, from 40 feet underneath. Um, additionally, what I had to devise was a, a whole series of, of emergency capture equipment that I could carry with me at all times so that when as sometimes happened, the animal would be darted, start to get groggy, leap from the tree and go dashing off into the swamp half half grogged, we would have to be able to run after the cat so we didn't lose it, and then once we found the animal, be able to treat it appropriately if it became apneic or something. So after some, some early mistakes of, of everyone dashing off through the swamp and corralling the cat and nobody having the gun, nobody having the drugs, nobody <laughs> having anything else to finish the capture, um, it evolved. So that was the early part of my challenge was to improve the safety. 
And you can see it as the situation evolved, um, we ended up carrying a, 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 an entire veterinary clinic on our back, complete with oxygen tanks and ambu bags and IV fluids and the like, um, in order to improve the, the quality of anesthesia and safety for these, these animals. And while we would have the animal anesthetized, we would take various biological samples, um, evaluate physical condition, um, take skin biopsies for genetic assays and other, um, other studies, and the whole host of biological samples, such as you see here, blood, urine, feces, ectoparasites, the whole gamut. And we would put a radio collar on these animals because in parallel to my study, which was looking at the biomedical factors of their endangerment, um, there was a, a companion study being conducted by Dave Mayer and other field biologists whereby radio collars were fixed to these animals and then their movements, social interactions, food habits, home ranges were then investigated, trying to dis, um, understand ecological factors that were important to these animals. And then they were followed, as you see here with radio telemetry. So what have we learned? When we started this project in the early 80s, all we knew was that, yes, indeed, there were panthers in South Florida. We saw footprints. Occasionally, farmers or ranchers would see animals, but we really didn't know a whole lot more at the time. In fact, in the late 70s, it was thought that this animal was actually extinct in the swamps in South Florida. And it was only by WWF hiring, or World Wildlife Fund, hiring a houndsman to actually attempt to capture an animal that we discovered that, in fact, they did still exist in the southern swamps. And that occurred in late 70s. And so the Game Commission in Florida embarked on an aggressive field study in the early 80s, trying to discern what factors were involved in, um, in the animal's situation. What we learned early on was that adverse interaction with humans was one of the major causes of mortality. And here what we're talking about are cats getting hit by vehicles. Um, as the population in South Florida has grown over the last 20, 30 years, so has the encounters with, um, fatal encounters with the cats. Because the cats unwittingly followed the logging roads that went north and south, the major highways in the state went east and west, and where the twain met is where often cats got killed. And early on, you can see that roadkill here comprised over 50% of the known mortalities, illegal kill another 25%. And as a consequence of that early work with the radio telemetry, major changes were done to the road structure down there that involved law enforcement, such as changing the nighttime speed zones here. Um, $10 million worth of road infrastructure was put in place to allow for cats and other animals to pass underneath this major highway um, upgrade that was going on that spanned the entire breadth of southern Florida. 100 miles of road were being upgraded. Initially, the plan was to just stick chain link fence along this 100 miles of highway with no way for the cats or any other animal to pass from one side to the next. And obviously, from a genetic standpoint and dealing with fragmented populations, that was not the wisest move. And so with these underpasses, animals have been documented to routinely now be using these, these paths to cross from one side to another. Now, the other thing that I noticed early on was that many, many of the cats were very thin and emaciated. And you can see this is an old female here, um, very thin, not in very good physical condition. In fact, she was in such bad shape that we did not capture her. And we left her in the tree for fear of actually harming this animal during a capture procedure. But as I captured more and more cats, I became concerned about the nutritional status of animals, particularly in a couple locations where we were capturing animals in the Big Cypress. And what we learned from looking at fecal samples to determine what their food habits were was that although deer and deer-sized packages of food, such as wild hog, are the preferred prey item, in fact, many, many of the animals were surviving on raccoons, particularly in the southern Fakahatchee Strand. Now, this was quite surprising. And at first, when I was investigating this, I thought that the, that the thinness and, and poor physical condition of the females, in particular, was related to simply just not enough calories. But then, as the project progressed, suddenly I discovered that we had another problem, and that was an environmental contaminant of mercury. And one of the animals, a young female, died, and her primary prey item was raccoons. And when we were investigating her cause of death, we discovered that she had inordinately high levels of mercury in her, her body tissues. And so we investigated retrospectively tissues from 
raccoons. And, um, and actually, first we looked at um, tissues from the, uh, the cats. And I hope you'll excuse this uh, slide. It's a little bit bent here. But you can see, basically, if you look at the height of these bars here as the amount of whole blood mercury in respective panthers, depending on the location where they were captured, in the northern lands, north of the, that roadway I showed you, where the cats consume primarily deer and hog, very, very low raccoon, you see their blood levels of mercury was fairly low. Whereas if you moved into the southern Fakihatchee and in that Shark River Slough, the river of grass in the middle of the Everglades system, where those animals were eating a lot of raccoons, they, also, they had very, very high levels of mercury. This is of concern to us because it is known from other studies that the higher level of mercury, high level of mercury, is related to reproductive incompetence. Because fetuses are aborted, um, there's learning disabilities, there's problems with early fetal or early neonatal survival in, um, in animals that have high mercury. And this has been documented in domestic cats in Japan, as well as it's seen in human beings that have exposed to high levels of mercury. And so what we were able to demonstrate is that, for instance, females that had fairly high levels of mercury also had, excuse me, females that had very low levels of mercury had the highest reproductive output than those that had the highest levels of mercury. And so in the Everglades ecosystem, where they appeared to be exposed to higher levels of mercury, they had the lowest reproductive output. And this seemed to be related to the consumption of eating raccoons. And in some cases, we had males that were, um, that had figured out how to kill alligators who had high levels of tissue mercury. So in order to validate this, we looked at a transect across South Florida where we collected raccoons and actually looked at raccoon tissue, basically going from west to east. And what we found was, in fact, the same kind of pattern, was that in the northern lands and moving to the east, you see that raccoon tissues had much higher levels of mercury in the middle of the slough. Now, mercury is interesting in that it is an aquatic food chain concentrated contaminant. And so it's in the invertebrates, it's in the crustaceans and the fish, the raccoons are eating these, and then it's being concentrated in their tissues so that when a panther starts consuming those raccoons, they also are going to have higher levels of mercury. And what's interesting about this is we still do not know the source of the mercury in that ecosystem. It's concerned by, uh, felt by some that it might be related to agricultural practices or golf courses in southern Florida that use a lot of fungicides that contain mercury, or possibly the agricultural practices have basically mined elemental er mercury that it was in the peat soils, the anaerobic peat soils around Lake Okeechobee, and that is now exposed and is in the aquatic uh, food chain. But that's a very important contaminant that is still being investigated. Now, let's go back to those peculiar traits. We saw the kink tail early on. We've identified some of the um, environmental kite type problems, such as hit by cars and, and uh, environmental contaminants, nutritional problems. But what about the genetics of this animal? We have this kink tail. Do we have any evidence that the cats are suffering any untoward problems? Well, one way to look at this is by collecting blood samples, isolating the DNA, and, um, and looking at the relative amount of genetic diversity in the Florida panther. Now, in order to put the Florida panther in perspective, I had to get samples from other populations of mountain lions where the cats seem to be doing fairly well, such as in the western United States, where I went and I worked with um, Alan Anderson in Colorado and collected samples from his animals. Uh, from Texas, Roy McBride collected his animals from free-ranging cats there. And the first part of the study, you can see by collecting samples from various parts of the United States to compare with the Florida panther, these are the study sites. We then extended the study um, with funding from the David Shepard Foundation into British Columbia, where we collected cats um, in the far northern part of the range, as well as in southern Chile, in the southern Andes, uh, working with field biologists in all these respective locations to collect samples from their animals and from zoo settings um, in various locations where they knew that the animals had come in from the wild. So we at least could put them on a map as far as their genetic origin. And then working at the National Cancer Institute, doing some early work with alizymes to look for genetic diversity. This is what I found early on in the Florida panther. And basically what we saw here was this particular genotype or the gene pro protein structure here. Every single animal I looked at was monomorphic. And uh, of the Florida panthers, I looked at 50 different proteins. Basically all but two or three showed monomorphism for the Florida panther compared to other subspecies of cat. 
Now you can't see this very well, but we've got Arizona, Texas, and California captive cats here, Florida panthers down here. And when you can see that both in the number of poly percent polymorphic loci and the heterozygosity, the Florida panthers are on the bottom of the spectrum of cats that I looked at. Now, taking this a bit further, a bit more sophisticated techniques, working with Dr. Steve O'Brien at the National Cancer Institute, we looked at the um, DNA fingerprints of these animals to give us a bit more information. And what you can see here, if you just kind of squint and look at the black bars across the page here, Arizona, Western Oregon, British Columbia, Wyoming, California, basically every animal that was examined was different from every other animal. This is very different than what we saw in the Florida panther where every cat we looked at was identical for these DNA fingerprints. This is the kind of assay that was done in the O.J. Simpson trial and a lot of legal cases where it's highly, highly unlikely and unusual that two individuals from the same population will have the same genetic profile. So this to us was highly significant, the fact that these Florida panthers were basically identical. Now, the story takes a little bit of twist in the late 80s uh, when we started working in the Everglades National Park. Prior to this time, all the animals we had captured was on the western side in the Big Cypress. And the very first animal we captured in the Big Cypress was this lovely female. And I want to draw your attention right here, her tail, a big, bushy, straight tail. And her face was not the typical Florida panther face we had seen before. And this was highly peculiar to us. And in fact, as we captured more cats, the pattern sustained itself. And what we had east to west was a highly different um, pattern of straight tail cats in the Everglades, kink tail cats on the Big Cypress. Now, was this in fact demonstrating to us that we had a unique population in the Everglades, or had something been introduced in the Everglades, or was the Shark River Slough acting as a complete impediment for gene flow across here? These are questions we didn't know at the beginning. But as we did further analyses looking at both allozyme data and um, other genetic markers, what we found is that there was this unique APRT loc loc locus that we found basically in every single Everglades animal and only a couple in the Big Cypress. You see here, th this is a straight tail cat. This was a kink tail cat. And when we looked at the mitochondrial DNA, which is a maternally inherited form of DNA, what we found again was complete concordance with the straight tailed cats had one type of mitochondrial DNA and the kink tail cats had another type. Now, let's back out a bit further and say, well, how does this compare to other populations in North America? And what we found was that, in fact, the A type here, which is our kink tail big cypress, was much more closely aligned to all the cats in the western United States, and the B type was more aligned with cats from South America. Now, this obviously is quite a surprising finding um, to us. And when we looked at the phylogeny or put these together in terms of genetic distance from each other, we found these two major clades of cats, those in North America, save the Everglades, and a South American group. So we had something very, very peculiar going on in the Everglades. And this was politically quite um, disturbing to discover this because the Florida panther was designated as an endangered subspecies, Felis concolor corii under U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service law. And if we, in fact, could demonstrate we had something else introduced, what did that mean to the future of the Florida panther, as it was named? And um, there was quite a bit of concern about that, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, how could this happen? Well, it turns out in the, about 1957, in a park in Bonita Springs, Florida, there was a group of, of Florida panthers that were there that the superintendent of Everglades National Park asked the fellow to release some of these cats into the Everglades because they felt that the population in the Everglades was not what it used to be. Now, the reason that he might do that is because in this Everglades Wonder Gardens Park, there were cats that, in fact, originated in the Big Cypress Swamp in the 40s. And you will notice that this cat here, and this is Les Piper's legs, photographed from 1942, still hanging on the wall at Everglades Wonder Gardens, you notice this cat has a kink tail and a cowlick, very characteristic of the cats living in the Big Cypress. Okay? And it so happens that I was able to go and bleed cats living today at Everglades Wonder Gardens, and lo and behold, they matched the Everglades type. And you can see here's a family here, 
Okay, orient you first. These A type are the ones living in the big cypress. Okay? These B, the alternate form, and the heterozygote form, this is a family in the Everglades. These are the Piper cats. They match the Everglades type. So this, at least for me, linked the release of those cats from Everglades Wonder Gardens into the Everglades as a possible source of this errant genetic material. We then take it back a bit further, work that's going on in our laboratory now by Dr. Melanie Culver, um, who's actually typing all pumas from North and South America. We now know that this particular version of mitochondrial DNA has came from Panama. Um, so sometime between 1940s and when the cats were released, a cat of, um, a female cat of Panama ancestry was introduced in the Everglades Wonder Gardens population, bred with those animals, and then subsequently was released into the wild. Now, back in the early 60s, nobody was concerned about endangered species. The act didn't exist. What was a subspecies? That wasn't really known at all. Um, as far as they knew, they had Florida panthers, and what did it really matter if they might have bred with another race of puma? Well, in the 1990s, it is a big deal. In fact, it caused a major consternation for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in now how they dealt with these apparent intergressed hybrid cats. And as a consequence of our work and the publication of an article in Science, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service now has a policy for dealing with hybrid cats. And in the case of the Florida panther, because it happened so long ago, the intergression apparently is so minor in terms of living animals, and it actually benefited the Florida panther that, in fact, it is allowed to stand, and the Florida panther maintained their endangered status. Now, the benefit, this is what I think is very interesting here. This intergression occurred in the, in the early 60s, and you can't see the type very well, but we have Florida Everglades National Park, Florida panther, big cypress. Number of polymorphic loci are the same. However, heterozygosity is just a smidgen higher in the Everglades, not much. Okay. Kink tail business. Um, I mentioned that was a morphologic trait that was peculiar. Well, what other evidence of inbreeding? I showed you we had that monomorphic DNA fingerprinting. So now we've got this integration. You know, did that help them at all? Um, a little bit, as seen by the allozyme data. But what other morphologic traits that might tell us about the genetic status and health of our wild Florida panthers? To orient you to this slide, we have a male external genitalia of a puma. The penal sheath here, two nice round testes inside the scrotal area and the anus. Now this is a normal cougar genitalia. This is what we started seeing in many, many Florida panthers. Again, to orient you, the penal sheath and a single smaller testes. Again, the normal and the Florida panther. Now, what was interesting about this is when I started on the project in the early 80s, I think four males had been handled, and in the records it showed that one of them was a crypt orchid. I thought, well, that's interesting, but not highly significant. I mean, after all, crypt organism does occur in many mammalian species. It occurs in 3% of all human males that are born. So, okay, one Florida panther with a crypt orchid. Um, and then, a couple years later, another one popped up. And I thought, okay, well, two out of about seven. All right, that's a little interesting, but not highly significant. And on cat number three, I made the joke. Aha, traits of a Florida panther, kink tail, cowlick, and a missing testicle. And I thought it was a joke at the time. However, um, time went by, and lo and behold, we started having males present with no testicles. And again, to orient you, the penal sheath, the scrotum, with nothing there. Now, this particular animal has been shaved um, for surgery, for surgical purposes. And this is because um, as the recovery effort progressed, we actually embarked on a um, captive breeding program, and one of the very first males that was brought in for a captive breeding endeavor, based on his genetic contribution, i.e. based on who his parents were and who he wanted to represent in a captive setting, we discovered on his post-quarantine evaluation that he had no testicles. And to me, this unfortunately epitomized the rate at which we were progressing with the, with the recovery of the Florida panther. And I hope you can appreciate that it's pretty difficult to recover 
an animal and Im use this particular male for captive breeding when he has no testicles because he's obviously completely sterile, of no use to anything or anybody. And what we were attempting to do here was actually go and resurrect and pull down the, the testes which were up here in the inguinal canal. Now this is a routine su surgery done on human males on infant babies. Um, this male was about 14 months old. They reached sexual maturity at about 18 to 24 months. We were hoping that we were still early enough, and unfortunately we were not. But when we look back at the presentation of this particular peculiar trait in males based on the year of their birth, and this is an estimation of their age based on their, their age at the time of capture. So in 1980, we started capturing males that were 10 years old. So we put them back here in this early cohort year. And what you can see here is there's a logarithmic rate of change from very low prevalence of cryptorchidism to basically fixing at greater than 90% of the males born after 1990 were missing testicles, either unilateral or bilateral. And the significant thing here, if you look at the triangles, these are males that had evidence of introgression of genetic material from South America. These are our Everglades National Park males. No evidence of cryptorchidism in any of the males carrying even that modicum, small amount of outbred, um, outbreeding material, uh, genetic material. So that's highly interesting. The other thing that it's worth pointing out here is one of the criticisms of the um, critique of the cryptorchidism being related to genetic problems is that some people have felt that it's strictly due to environmental contamination with various estrogenic compounds when these males are in utero. And what I like to point out is that these males are the ones living in the um, mercury contaminated environment where if you're going to have environmental contaminants, that's the ecosystem that it's going to be accumulated in. And yet none of them show any problems. So another, oh, this is the pedigree of those individuals here, um, this is, these are the bilateral cryptorchid males here. You see that their fathers both are cryptorchid. They have siblings in some cases that are mono, uh, unilateral and bilateral. And you can see almost every pedigree, every family line has got individuals that are cryptorchid. I mean, we have, I think there's one normal male um, here. And his father was a cryptorchid. And so we don't know the exact inheritance of this. That's yet to be discovered. And here's the Everglades pedigree. And you can note here we've documented several loops of inbreeding from here's an Everglades loop where a, a, the, the male offspring is bred back to his mother. And in the Big Cypress, the same kind of thing where the daughter ends up breeding back to the father. And we have um, this inbreeding loop here. So given the very small size of the Florida panther population and the um, longevity of certain males staying in that population long enough to breed back their daughters, we have documented inbreeding going on. So what other traits have we been able to examine? We know from other species of big cats, such as the cheetah, that inbreeding results in spermatic problems, uh, spermatozoal problems. And what we saw in the cheetah was that every ex male examined had 70% of, of spermatozoa were abnormal. And so we obviously wanted to ask the question of the Florida panther. What did their sperm look like? And so by using electroejaculation techniques in a field setting, collecting sperm and evaluating it on site, looking at things like motility, status, uh, um, what have you, what we discovered was that the Florida panther had very, very low concentration of sperm. The vitality of each sperm was, was hideous. Most of them were swimming in circles. And then when we did the, um, oh, this is a typical sperm here. You see a twisted neck here. Uh, uh, the tail had a uh, protoplasmic droplet. Um, and this acrosome defect on the front here. So this sperm, even if you were to, if it could somehow bump into an egg somewhere along the way, it couldn't even fertilize it because the acrosome is critical for that fusion and for penetration and fertilization to occur. And when we looked at a number of males, what we found is that over 90% of the spermatozoa of every single individual male panther was abnormal. It was as though they were pushing some biological threshold of procreation. Um, and if this was a human patient, they would blame the, the male as being responsible for lack of conception. What was interesting here is the panther still managed to conceive. And babies were still being born. And obviously, they must have um, had copulatory activities that enhanced reproduction or what have you, because we still had 
fetuses being born. Now, when we looked at the comparison of the Florida panther with other races of cat, here's Florida, Texas, Chile, what you see is basically every single trait we looked at, B, testicular volume, spermatic motility, everything, the Florida panther had the lowest values compared to every other race of cat we looked at. Now, going back to the Piper cats and say, well, what do they look like comparison to the Everglades or to the Big Cypress? And the type A are the historical types, okay? Just review, they had slightly um, lower uh, polymorphic loci than the Everglades type. And when we look at their traits, we only see the cryptorchids in the historical pure Florida panthers. We don't see it in either the captive Piper animals or the Everglades. And in all the other testicular traits, the true Florida panthers have lower qualities than do the Everglades types. Okay, so, so we have that modest improvement in genetic diversity and we still see changes in the spermatic quality. Now, the, even the Everglades types though are dramatically poorer than um, the captive stock and any other race um, in the, that we've examined. And just a, a bar graph showing you that the Florida panthers, be it Everglades or Big Cypress, are on the bottom of the cline of for every trait we looked at, be it sperm concentration, motility, abnormal sperm, or, ab or acrosomal defects. And these are, for comparative purposes, we've got the domestic cat, uh, leopard, tiger, and cheetah are off on the right-hand side of each of these bars. So you see, even though the cheetah had such notoriety for um, genetic monomorphism as, and high abnormal sperm counts, the Florida panther beat, beat it out. Okay, now, so we thought it was pretty bad. We've got missing testicles, we've got terrible sperm. Well, what other evidence? Well, this is a radiographic silhouette of a normal cougar heart. And what, about 1990, about the time the bilateral cryptorchid male started showing up, we started, I started documenting cats dying of heart failure due to atrial septal defects. And this is a radiograph, again, of a, um, a Florida panther with a markedly enlarged heart, as you see here. And this, unfortunately, was also a cat brought in for captive breeding. Um, this cat, the day we captured her, you could auscultate, almost palpate, a, a palpable thrill on her chest um, due to this heart murmur. And again, the heroics of trying to salvage this uh, particular race of cat, working with Shan's uh, hospital in Gainesville, Florida, with the cardiac surgeons and the veterinary staff at the university, we endeavored open heart surgery to repair this cat's heart. And we did a sham surgery on a Texas cougar, and that's what you see here. And we opened his heart, we went through the whole um, surgical procedure, everything went fine. Unfortunately, the Florida panther um, did not go so well, and uh, she didn't make it through surgery. And this is just the surgical profile here. For a veterinarian, this was quite interesting to me to see what's involved actually in open heart surgery with the massive um, amount of blood we had to obtain from other um, cougars as donors and just all the paraphernalia that was involved here. And this is a heart here and you can see this atrial septal defect um, right, right here. Now you might ask why? Why are we doing these heroics on animals that are obviously doomed? And the thinking was, or at least at the time the idea was, we wanted to save the Florida panther or at least some genes of the Florida panther. And yes, there are deleterious genes that go along for the ride among all of us. And the Florida panther has evidence of the atrial septal defect, they have missing testicles, but they have other traits that make them unique as a being. And if in fact we could keep them alive long enough to outcross them potentially to a small amount of genetic material from another race, we could in fact have mostly a Florida panther alive in South Florida. That was the plan. Um, unfortunately, about the time you might think that it can't get any worse, um, what is happening, and this is actually, I left the project in, um, in 1992, and since that time, there has been numerous documented cases of cats developing full-blown systemic fungal infections. And this particular cat took his photograph um, for an article in National Geographic. It was published in 1986, um, 96, excuse me. And what I find fascinating about this is that this animal has systemic ringworm. This is not typical of what you see um, in normal cat um, dermatophyte infection. And one of the questions that I am now pursuing and have about the Florida panther is, number one, is this just a continuum of the, 
of the, of the denigration of the genetic quality of this animal in terms of immune system function? I mean, that's question number one. Or, or and, do we have another co, um, co-pathogen that might be contributing to this particular problem? And through my present work at the National Cancer Institute, we are very interested in the pathogen feline immunodeficiency virus. And um, previous work has demonstrated that the puma, throughout its range, has, is infected with a puma strain of FIV. It's unique from the domestic cat. It's unique from the lion. Um, and in Florida, our population was running around 25% or so. And you can see from this, these bar graphs that virtually all of the populations examined, save some of the ones in South America, have a certain percentage of animals infected with FIV. Now, we don't know for sure what this virus is doing to this species. We know in the domestic cat, it causes pathology and death. In the free-ranging animal, it's much more difficult to ascertain that because free-ranging animals get taken out by other predators. They get taken out by nutritional problems. You do not have the luxury of watching and allowing a lingering disease process to go forth. So one of the ways that I'm investigating the potential effect of this virus is looking at the immune system by look, um, specifically looking at lymphocyte populations of animals that are handled, that look clinically normal, but that are infected with FIV. And by looking at the T cell population here, you see, um, and the proportion of CD4s versus CD8s, which ought to be a two to one ratio, Except in the case of humans infected with HIV, domestic cats with FIV, what happens is that virus preferentially depletes the CD4 population, and you get a distortion of the ratio, as well as the absolute numbers of CD4 cells. So I have been asking the question of the Florida panther, well, what does it look like in the case of cats that are infected with the virus, those that we know not to be? Confounding our investigation is that we have a group of animals that are clearly FIV positive, and this is what their CD4 population looks like. We have cats have exceedingly low counts of like 100 or 200. A group in here, you see three and four hundreds, and a group that looks fairly normal, c- compatible with what's seen in the domestic cat. The negatives tend to go higher in their CD4 count, but we have a group in the middle, and I call them suspicious because we get very peculiar Western blot patterns when we look at their um, serologic evidence of the disease. We think they're positive, but they're not giving the signal at the core protein for the virus that um, tells us that they're really positive. Whether these animals are immunosuppressed at some point so we don't see core antibody, um, we don't know. But if you look at just the real positives versus the real negatives, there is a difference. However, statistically, it's not significant. Now, our numbers may change as we get more animals, suggesting that FIV might be playing a role um, in the disease process. I should point out that the animal, the naked cat with the fungal infection, is this cat right here, above the number one. Very low CD4 count. I think his count was around 300. So he is immunocompromised for some reason, be it FIV or innate um, immunologic function due to genetics is yet to be discerned. Now, how do you save a species that is in this kind of plight? We've got obvious documented genetic problems, missing testicles, holes in the hearts. Um, I've already demonstrated to you that historically we, we documented a integration of genetic material that occurred in the early 60s, and it, appeared, it appears to have some degree of protection as far as the manifestation of the cryptorchid trait and a little bit of improvement in the spermatic quality. But to really save this animal, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service agreed that what we need to do is actually bring in outside genetic material from another race of cats. And again, the National Cancer Institute was involved in this this planning process, trying to decide, based on our genetic understanding of these species, where would be most appropriate to get animals for introduction to Florida. We already had samples from cats in Texas, which is the closest living relative of this animal. Or the other idea was, do we go with the closest living relative where there may historically have been gene flow, maybe 200 years ago? Or do we go the complete other gamut and go all the way to South America and say, bring in you know, widely divergent animals? And it was decided to go with the most, to try to reestablish basically historic gene flow. And so the decision was made to capture animals from Texas, bring them to Florida, and introduce them. And this was done in the beginning of 1996. 
And I believe I'm not involved in that project anymore, but my understanding was that um, eight females were brought in, and specifically females were chosen instead of males, and that was so that um, they would be more readily accepted into that population, where males would probably be killed by the resident males. And by bringing in females, we knew from other studies of translocations that they would probably stay uh, much closer to the site that they were released and would have a better probability of staying in that population. And so the cats were brought in in the spring of 96, and my understanding is that they have bred, they have produced successfully, and so now as we speak there are hybrid Florida panther Texas kittens um, in the swamps of South Florida. The big question, and this is still ongoing work that is now um, under the direction of Dr. Sharon Taylor in Florida, a veterinarian, the big question is, okay, my work demonstrated the need for this kind of integration of genetic material. The Florida panther, as we knew it, was basically extinct um, as it in its historic form. And so now the next phase of this is the grand experiment. What will happen if you bring in outside genetic material? What will happen to both the reproductive traits of the male, the reproductive uh, fertility, fecundity of females, these peculiar traits such as missing testicles and kink tails? What will happen there? Um, those questions are still to be answered. Um, but I think what this has demonstrated to us and the reason that this study has been so powerful for the endangered species recovery efforts is what we learned far too late was that we didn't start soon enough in our rescue efforts. And at the beginning of our study with animal number one with a cryptorchid trait, if we knew then that we had to aggressively expand that population to get cats into captivity, so that we didn't continue for the next 10 years with inbreeding and inbreeding depression and expression of deleterious traits, we may still have true Florida panthers running in the swamp today instead of having hybrids. So this, this is now being used as a case study for many, many other endangered species as far as what can go wrong in a free-ranging situation. It has broad implications for conservation of many, many other um, animals. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>